Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. I guess that's it. Yes, I guess that's the thing directly in front of me. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in back of us. Spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. Uh, getting in front of my line of vision. Uh, 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 would you mind standing one side, please? While the police are pushing the crowd back. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello, playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel, situated in downtown New York. <laughs> one man wants to touch the thing. There's something happening. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. What? It's, it's standing on legs, actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees and the searchlights are on it. Hold on. They rise like a line of new towers on the city's west side. Do you hear it? It's a curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll uh, move the microphone nearer. This is the end now. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello, playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel, situated in downtown New York. to hunt us. Oh, no. Yes, they will. There's men who do it gladly. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. no biological effects at all, and that's not correct. Industry wants people to believe that the work they support is better than the work that anybody else has ever done, and of course that's, that's not correct also. Joining me on the telephone is Dr. Jerry Phillips. He's currently the director of the Science Learning Center and a professor at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. He's also one of the scientists who were essentially manhandled by Motorola. Thank you for joining us, Jerry. Uh, before we got involved with Motorola, I was doing work investigating the biological effects of 60 hertz electric and magnetic fields. Uh, those electric and magnetic fields associated with high voltage power lines, normal appliance use in the house. In 1990, I'm, our group was approached by the director of research at Motorola. That actually he, he pushed very hard to get the group interested in accepting a contract from Motorola to investigate the biological effects of cell phone frequency radiation. So Motorola wanted nothing to do with DNA damage. They didn't want our group to appear to confirm any of the Washington group's results. What, what Motorola ended up doing was cutting funding to our group. I mean, I was told by the head of our group at the time to give Motorola what they wanted or it could be harmful to my career. Are there any uh, scientific studies that are not paid for by the industry that are being done? Well, there, there are in countries outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. there, there's very little work that I know of that's actually going on in this country that isn't supported by the cell phone industry. Government certainly isn't interested in solving the problem, 
And, uh, I mean, it's sort of understandable when you look at uh, the proposed lead agency for work in this agency was the FDA. I had a phone conversation with a man who was soon to become the director of research at Motorola. He had left his position at the FDA and moved to Motorola. And my guest today is Dr. Neil Cherry. Dr. Cherry is from New Zealand. He has a doctorate in physics. That's where the doctor comes from. And he's done so many things, I just uh, don't even know where to start. And so I've discovered that the body is full of electromagnetic signals. Our brain is an electromagnetic organ. Our central nervous system, every cell communicates with its neighbors to see how they are using electromagnetic signals. And so it's an internal thing. And there's a concept in physics and in uh, telecommunications called interference, resonant absorption, an aerial effect. We have all of that in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so I was uh, surprised to find that there's so sensible biological, biophysical understanding within our bodies that says these signals interfere with us through resonant absorption by our brains, through damaging our chromosomes in our cells. And so I came up with these simple ideas. Okay, if we have a conductor in us, like water, can we be an aerial? Mm -hmm. If we're an aerial, what is the organ that goes through our body, our circulation system, our blood, which is full of water? So what's the main cancer that's caused? Leukemia, mm -hmm. which occurs in the blood and the bone marrow going through our bodies. And so whether we're going under power lines with these fields causing a, an induced field in our bodies with a current flowing down our body to earth, or we're standing in a radio field that hits us, gets absorbed in our body and causes a current to flow to earth, same thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> then we get leukemia. And our sensitive brains, we get brain cancer. And so I have found all these studies showing chromosome damage, DNA damage, which then suggests that you might have other diseases like neurological disease, heart disease, reproductive disease. And the research that followed up here in the United States showed that Yes, reaction time changes, the EEG changes, and it's caused by calcium ion, efflux and influx. And calcium ions control the neurotransmitters in the brain, form the EEG patterns, are well organized if you're thinking well, mm -hmm. and they're well organized at these frequencies. And if you expose the brain to these frequencies, you alter the calcium ions, and therefore alter the brain patterns. Now that's what, what Professor Ross Aidey in California showed, repeated by the... Uh, EPA, Carl Blackman, and it's been repeated in about 10 or 20 laboratories around the world <laughs> that calcium ions are changed by these signals. So it's very well established and it makes a lot of sense in terms of physics and biology. So the frequencies match and the cells react and change their behavior, which changes the brain pattern, the reaction time. Uh, there's more aggression, there's more suicide, there are epileptic fits, there's more sudden infant death syndrome. Um, so there are heart attacks and they, when they use their cell phones they reduce melatonin and so if something interferes with that then it can cause brain effects, heart effects, stomach effects, reproductive effects, cancer effects. Cindy Sage worked on the Bioinitiative Report, a recent summation by top EMF experts on more than 2,000 scientific studies showing health hazards from cell phone, portable phone, and other wireless exposures. The, the word EMF, or electromagnetic field, is a broad one. And contained in it are the things that evolve around electric appliances and power lines, extremely low frequency fields. And this, this EMF issue also encompasses radio frequency radiation and microwave radiation. And those are, um, those are emissions that you get from cell phones, cell towers, uh, Wi-Fi and WiMAX, wireless communications. Um, so it's really broadly all of those things that either give us electric power or that give us the ability to communicate in a wireless fashion. 
and there are emissions, and they have important biological effects. There are 30 years worth of scientific studies documenting bioeffects and adverse health effects from these exposures, and yet we are still living with the same old standards we've had for years. In 2006, um, a group of scientists met at the Bioelectromagnetic Society annual meeting to highlight a couple of things for several hundred scientists who meet at those meetings. The first was to focus on the science, to say, these are the studies we believe show an effect at levels that are everyday levels. The general conclusions of the Bioinitiative report are these. The existing standards that we have worldwide for electromagnetic fields, including power lines, including cell phones, including cell towers, cordless phones, basically all of these things we've looked at, these standards that we have today are thousands of times too high. It's inescapable. If you look at the studies in aggregate, if you look at all of the science studies, they clearly tell us that we are living in a world today where the standards that we have do not protect public health. And the consequences of not doing something about this are going to be huge in terms of public health, in terms of sickness for people, in terms of lower quality of life because people don't, don't feel well, they don't work well in these environments. And the, the cost to society over time, if we do nothing, are going to be enormous. And we don't just need trivial or do-nothing kinds of cures. We are so far down the road in understanding the problem that we are calling for very substantial change. <laughs> People think it takes a lot of exposure to a cell phone to have an increased rate of brain tumors show up. And in fact, we're beginning to see it with only 260 lifetime hours of exposure. You begin to see the risk with only 260 hours. Leonard Hardell's work looks toward the top end of users, the heavy users, and he looks at anybody with 2,000 or more lifetime hours of exposure. And he's seeing very substantial and statistically significant increased risk of brain tumors and acoustic neuromas with 2,000 or more hours. Well, you know, I work with people, I know people, who average 900 minutes a month. So in two months, three months, four months, five months, a year, I mean, I do the calculation, but a couple of years, and you've hit your maximum 2,000 hours easily. I, I, I have great concern that for the, the brain tumor and acoustic neuroma risk, the threshold for danger is so low. You're over it, you're over it, you're over it. We're all over it if we've used a cell phone in, in work for a few years, three years, five years. So this is going to come back to haunt us and we're really going to, we're really going to have to pay attention. It would be a very bad idea to ignore these warnings. The evidence is there. And a very important finding in, that is uh, brought out in our report is that when you see stress proteins produced in the body, this is always, this is a very ancient response of all cells, literally in plants and animals and people. When you see heat shock proteins being expressed by cells or being created, it means the cell is in trouble and it's hollering help. It's, it's got a problem with the environment around it that isn't good for it. When you're exposed to very low levels of electromagnetic fields, we see stress proteins created. There really is no low uh, limit at which things are safe. How young is too young for your kids to get one of these films? I don't know. I see a lot of kids these days who have them, and I'm sure Russa Enyart from Wireless Toys, you do as well. I, you know, what age are you starting to see parents coming in? Uh, the kids, though, the kids are anywhere from, you know, 8 and 9 and up uh, that we're seeing. Um, we don't want to give them advice on what an appropriate what do you age. Think it is? <laughs> I have a one-year-old. Uh, she plays with my phone all the time. Uh, even at eight and nine years old, they already know how to use a phone, so they're getting them uh, just the entry-level free phone, which is really going to save you some dollars. It's unlimited calling, unlimited text. The number you have reached: nine one one.
has been changed to a non-published number. When patients come in with a brain cancer, I often say to them, you know, your cancer is on the right side of your brain, it's in the area just above your ear. Can you tell me if you feel that you've had more exposure than most people to mobile phones? And I am surprised that most people say, yes, uh, you know, I've used my phone continuously for the last seven years and it's always stuck to my ear on this side. Can you hear me now? Brain tumours now claim more young lives than any other form of cancer. The tumour rate has increased by a staggering 21% in just a decade. One of our leading surgeons is worried about a link with the growing use of mobile phones and other electrical equipment. Kessie McConnell was only seven when the family doctor thought she had a fever. Kessie was dead within weeks from a brain tumour. We had to watch Kessie lose the ability to talk, to walk, to move. She was a joy. Dr. George Carlo is a world-recognized medical scientist, author, and lawyer. He has more than 150 medical, scientific, and public policy publications in the areas of public health, workplace safety, and consumer protection. His most recent book, Cell Phones, Invisible Hazards, in the wireless age. When the cell membrane, whether it's a brain cell or a blood cell, recognizes that there's a, uh, an electromagnetic field in the immediate vicinity, it recognizes that as a foreign invader and it begins a series of biochemical responses to protect itself. And part of that protective mechanism is to harden the cell membrane so nutrients cannot get into the cell and it compromises the energy and the uh, metabolism of the cell. But more importantly, Waste products build up inside the cell, and those waste products include free radicals, and those free radicals interfere with DNA repair and cause genetic damage. So when the cell lives out its life and it bursts open, there are little pieces of DNA called micronuclei that have membranes around themselves. They proliferate, and uh, that is a mechanism leading to the development of a tumor. Well, the other thing that we've found now is that part of the damage from the uh, cell phone radiation is to disrupt the communication between cells. So intracellular communication is disrupted. So the messages that would be normally needed to, um, to clean up material like these micronuclei are not sent. Oh. Background level of radiation is, uh, is getting so high now. If you use a headset, however, that has a wire or one of these uh, Bluetooth headsets, which will hang on your ear but it has no wire going between the phone and the, and the instrument itself, those headsets will actually serve as a, an antenna to attract ambient electromagnetic radiation. So um, there's, there's no easy solution. Charlie Teo is a preeminent neurosurgeon. He specializes in children's brains. And Charlie is at the cutting edge, literally, of a 21% increase in children's brain tumors. What advice do you give your children? Oh, Ray, this is a very sore point. My, my daughter just got a mobile phone, and, uh, and I was so against it. Uh, it was a real sore point in the family. How old is she, Charlie? She's 12. So she's in that vulnerable age. Oh, very vulnerable. Her brain is still developing, and I'm really very upset that she's got one. And we have this new tonight, a Sacramento County teen is bragging about a big accomplishment. She logged more than 300,000 text messages in just one month. <laughs> in schools, it's uh, become popular to install wireless internet connections for children's laptops. The exposure that a child would get in a school, going through a school like this, and from, you know, elementary to middle school to high school, would be very considerable over a lifetime. And uh, we really recommend against it now because it appears that it's an experiment where we don't know the health result. And it isn't worth the, the, the risk. Um, can we quantify the risk yet? No, because we're not allowed to do experiments on children. But every indication is that if it has uh, if wireless technologies and their emissions have such a big impact on adults from the studies we have, it will be worse on children. So we ha and we have good alternatives. We have we you can have great internet connections with cable modem, a wired alternative. So we don't need it. Why take the chance? 
this wireless exposure in classrooms is not trivial. If you've got everybody working on their computer and they're all wireless, you know, a couple of hours is a huge exposure. You know that look, the zombie stare, zombie stare, zombie, zombie, zombie. The Nielsen Company says the average teen between 13 and 17 sent 2,272 text messages a month at the end of last year. I think it's easier for some people to text because it's not really like, oh, I have to carry on a conversation or, oh, I have to, like, think of things to say. Butler University psychologist Carol Hagan says students don't realize how much texting interferes with basic interactions with other people. And also that it doesn't give people time to incubate thought or relationships. Dr. Hagan knows some people are afraid to turn the phone off for fear of missing a message. And then if I have the cell phone on and I'm sitting there and the text message comes, I can't not look at it. My best friend's sister, she had a lot of friends, just not enough time. So she got really good at texting while driving. I mean, she was amazing. But ever since the accident, everything has changed. It only takes a split second to lose your concentration. Police in Peoria, Arizona, it's calling this accident one of the worst they have ever seen, that accident happening on Monday. Officers say the teenager was text messaging when she crashed head-on with another driver. Both of them were killed. I got my driver's license four months ago. I text all the time. From the minute I walk out the door, I'm completely on the phone texting. I would say in a month, I probably send about 5000 if not over that, a month. I don't feel afraid that I'm going to get into a car accident while texting because I feel like I'm a good enough texter. I honestly don't think that there's anything that can make me stop texting and driving. You've had your driver's license how long? About four months. And you've uh, hit a curb because you forgot to shift gears while you were texting and did $3,000 damage. I did do that. Second, you nearly hit a person on the street with your little sister in the car because you were texting. You received a $164 ticket for going 80 and a 55, and you were texting and didn't notice the change. You also drifted forward and hit a guardrail. Yeah, but I barely scratched it. It was a little tiny scratch. All of this while you were texting? Yeah. Are you that arrogant and self-absorbed? that you would say, even with that driving record, I'm going to continue to do this because I can. You don't have the right to do that. You may think you can, and you may think you need to be plugged in about whatever's happening at school and the latest gossip, but I'm driving on that street. My mother's driving on the streets. All of our families are driving on the streets, and we're not really concerned with you being plugged in on the current drive. Students who were tested on uh, cell phones uh, while driving or, you know, simulated driving uh, were shown to have the reaction time of elderly people when they were under the influence, the, either the radio frequency or the, uh, the, the uh, diversion or both. But they, they, they were acting like old people uh, when they were driving as they used a cell phone. We continue now with our piano interlude. Um, Dr. Ole Johansson is Associate Professor, Head of the Experimental Dermatological Unit in the Department of Neuroscience at the Karolinska Institute, famous for its Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in Stockholm, Sweden. He is a world-leading authority in the field of electromagnetic radiation and health effects. He's published more than 500 original articles reviews, book chapters, and conference reports within the field of basic and applied neuroscience. Mobile telephony, indoor wireless connections, outdoor um, wireless fidelity, wireless internet, and so on, you know. And we are, I would say, surprised 
and maybe even a little bit shocked to see that all over the world this gigantic full-scale human biological experiment is taking place without governments, companies and so on really knowing that this is harmless. People in general, they anticipated that evolution had uh, given them a protection against um, human invented things like a mobile telephony or wireless internet or whatever, things that have been not around for more than 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years and that the evolution will protect them from such irradiation damage. And of course, the evolution has not given you any such protection whatsoever. It's especially important when we talk about our kids, because if we do gamble with their health and their possibilities for reproduction and so on, Jesus, I mean, tomorrow there may not even be a mankind reporting 100 years ahead of us. <sighs> It's extremely difficult, in Sweden at least, to get any funding to continue these kind of studies. Strange, because if you look around in the scientific literature today, you have so much published regarding such radiation-dependent effects at the molecular, cellular, tissue level, animal experimental level, as well as human experimental level. And I hear from my colleagues throughout the world that they do run into problems when they want to uh, duplicate previous research or continue along new lines. You know, because this is a very big political issue here, which is the politics of exposure. Do we yeah. have a right to be uh, to choose what we're exposed to? It's all over with humanity. Dead cows in a brackish field. My wife. My colleagues. My world. Where are they? Did they ever exist? What day is it? What'll they do to us? They haven't begun on us yet. Not begun? Not begun. They got themselves in solid. They wrecked the greatest country in the world. I want to live. And we're not going to be exterminated. And I don't mean to be caught either. Tamed and fattened and bred like an ox. What are you going to do? I'm going on. Right under their feet. I got a plan. We don't know enough. We got to learn plenty before we got a chance. We've got to live and keep free while we learn, see? All those little office workers that used to live in these houses, they'd be no good. They haven't any stuff in them. They used to run, run off to work. I've seen hundreds of them running to catch their commuter's train in the morning, afraid they could can if they didn't, running back at night, afraid they wouldn't be in time for dinner. Lives insured and a little invested in case of accidents. Nice roomy cages, good food, careful breeding, no worries. Yeah, and on Sundays, worried about the hereafter. You gotta make safe places for Amusement you're after, I guess the game's up.